Hello, my name is Bob and I'm a comedian. I wasn't always a comedian, of course. It started out simply enough. Like most adolescents, I had a few weak jokes at Christmas and at birthdays. And then one day at a wedding, I embarrassed myself with some stuff that was far too strong. And I felt terrible the next day. But that didn't slow me down much. I began joking earlier and earlier in the day. I'd even lock myself in the toilet and joke alone. I was turning into a jokeaholic. So I voluntarily applied for admission to a joke-free zone, and I've been at the BBC Television Centre ever since. Until now. I'm going on a joke binge. Join me. Ladies and gentlemen, live and forbidden, well, he's almost alive and should be forbidden, Bob Monkhouse! one and only lakeside. Well, it's not the one and only lakeside anymore. There is another lakeside in somewhere called Thurrock. <laughs> I don't know where the hell Thurrock is. It's a shopping mall. My wife went there. Animal rights activists threw paint over her because she was wearing a hat made of fox fur. And I feel partly responsible because when she told me she was going to Thurrock, she thought I said, where the fox at? <laughs> I tell you that gag right at the top to let you know how far I'm going to go. I will go no further than that. I'm telling you, I'll write down the rules right now. Let's tell them how far we're going to go, Laurie. Let's spell it out clearly. Well, you see, I've gone into business now. I've opened a sperm bank. But I'm very sad to say that business is slow. I'm running it at a loss, cause nobody gives a toss. That's about as far as I can go She's baking you fancy pies and treacly puddings She's giving you sex as sweet as you'll ever know Then suddenly you feel sick She's giving you spotted dick <laughs> That's about as far as I can go Say I'm dead Say I've no street cred but as for four-letter words, let's be frank Filth is a breeze, it gets laughs with ease You don't want me to stand here and waffle <laughs> She's given you wash and go to take in the shower She's rubbing that wash and go above and below and suddenly that's named dumb It ought to be wash and come And that's about as far as I can go Say I'm grey Say I'm yesterday But my image is keeping its class Don't get pissed at me Don't wag your fist at me Cause I don't want your fist up my nose <laughs> And if I tell all you guys you're sharp as a new pin Tell you girls you're needle sharp Believe me, I know I'm in an awful fix I just called you a bunch of pricks That's about as far as I can Stay as much a star as I can That's about as far It's great to see you. 
I love doing the fact that we're doing another video here in Lakeside. It's got style. This place has style. You want bread? A bread waiter comes over to your table and gives you bread. A water waiter comes over and gives you water. A head waiter comes over and gives you the perfect service. <laughs> Backstage, though, standards are dropping. I'm not kidding. I used to come here. I used to see Rolls Royces and Bentleys parked out there. I just looked out of my dressing room window not two minutes ago. I saw the manager. He was pumping a bike up against the wall. And that girl should be in here serving drinks right now. <laughs> Talking of drinks, is this what I'm... Is this, is this, this is what they give me? Cola? Great, great. What hospitality here? Virgin cola, yeah. Virgin cola, yeah, you see, you've got to get the, uh, the ring on the finger before you can open her up. <laughs> Remember cherry cola? That didn't last long either. <laughs> I heard rumours of 7-Up. <laughs> People say to me, before you start doing a video like this, because it's going to be sold in hundreds of thousands of copies, do you get nervous? Now, very early in, in my life in show business, I discovered that an audience can smell fear. Especially if you crap yourself as you walk on. <laughs> fear is something we all share. Anybody here with fear of flying? Anybody with a fear of flying? Yes, yes, yes. Believe me, I understand, but I want to tell you something. You haven't got a fear of flying. You think you have a fear of flying, you haven't. What you have a fear of is being two miles up in a plane and suddenly not flying. <laughs> You tell me you don't have a fear of flying. If you're two miles up in a plane and the tail drops off, you're going to go, flying is my favourite. <laughs> I don't like airline food. That's the reason I don't like flying. Their food is worse than my wife's, and you can't imagine that. Last week, she served me something for dinner. It was so foul, I gave it to the dog, and he licked his ass to get the taste out of his mouth. <laughs> tasted on any aircraft was TWA. Do you remember that airline? It went bust. I'm not surprised. One of their planes, I'm sorry, it crashed into the Pacific, but it did. And the sharks ate the crew and ate all of the customers. But they refused to touch the chicken Kiev. <laughs> and now I fly BA, I fly the flag. And you know those air stewardesses, whatever they're called now, flight attendants, they're getting older. But they can't fire them because they're getting older. That would be wrong, but they're turning into your mother. They're getting fatter, they're getting more maternal. They're going, eat the food, eat the food, eat the food. They give you the dinner, I can't eat the dinner, I couldn't finish the dinner. The woman said, finish the dinner, she said. She said, there are people starving on Air India. I thought, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> we flew in, must say, good, good flight, but on the landing, just as we came into Heathrow, the plane went, <laughs> like that. And as I got off the plane, I passed the pilot, I said, excuse me, nice flight, thank you. But as we came in, why did the plane go, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> I had an affair once with an air hostess. Well, this was years ago when you called them air stewardesses, and she was overtrained. She couldn't forget her training, even when we were about to make love. She said, welcome to the bed. Please extinguish all cigarettes and ensure the bedroom door remains closed at all times. Kindly place my seat in an upright position. <laughs> Prepare for takeoff. And do not attempt to exit until we've both come to a complete halt. <laughs> and what she meant when she said, place over the nose and mouth and breathe normally is nothing to do with you. <laughs> well. I may be an old guy now, but I've had my affairs, I've had my amours, oh sure, I wish I had a pound for every woman I'd satisfied. I'd have one pound fifty. <laughs> I knew nothing, I mean, we didn't have sex education. My generation wasn't educated at school. We had biology. They explained the menstrual cycle is something only girls have. I thought, oh, no crossbar. That's all right. <laughs> Little basket on the front. I remember my first real woman, the first time I ever got into bed with a real woman. She knew she was the first one I'd ever gotten to bed with. She knew, she knew. As soon as I tried to inflate her, she knew. <laughs> What's he doing with that bicycle pump shirt? 
Later she came to love it, but that's another story. She acted coy, she said, be gentle. I said, don't worry about that, I just finished. <laughs> but she was good. I mean, I was only about, I don't know, 18, 19. She got me going again, and you know, a young man that age, my God. I wasn't bad. I performed fairly well. As soon as I'd finished, she went in the bathroom, she came up with a baby, she said, this is yours, you've got to support him. <laughs> I said, I didn't know you could have a baby that fast. She said, that's how good you were. <laughs> I used to go out, I wasn't a very good looking youth, I was not, I had the pimples, I, had the, I was a little stout, and I used to go out with a girl, she was not attractive, her name was Roberta, I didn't realise how ugly she was, until one day I took her for a walk in the woods, and she found truffles. <laughs> she went to Ireland, they made her put a bag over her head before she could kiss the Blarney Stone. This is, this is ugly, right? I'm talking about wolf ugly, do you know what I mean by wolf ugly? Wolf ugly is when you wake up in the morning, and you find you've got your arm round her. And rather than wake her up, you chew your own arm off. <laughs> but you know, I was desperate, I'd take anything. I'm the scent of a woman, ah, the scent of a woman. She used to put something behind her ears that drove me wild. Her knees. Roberta. Her name was Roberta. Did I mention that? My name was Robert. I was Christian Robert. They shortened it to Bob. They shortened her name to Bobby. Then her friends called her Bob. We were the two Bobs. We were going around together. We were the two Bobs. Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. And Bob, Bob. There's Bob, Bob. She used to call out my name. While we were having sex, she'd go, Bob, Bob. I think she meant me. <laughs> she could have meant her. I don't know. But I gave her the benefit of the doubt, and I called out her name. I went, Bob. It's strange to hear us going, Bob, 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 Bob. Sounded as if we were shagging in a Swiss valley, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> with women nobody else wanted. I went out with a girl, I, li I, li I like a chubby lady. I like, I like, I love that. I admire ladies with flesh on them. I, the kind of, my favorite sort of woman is, is a woman who's so big you can fondle her all night and never touch the same place twice. <laughs> but this woman was so big. First time I had sex with her, five minutes getting on top. Five minutes it took me, clambering on top. Then I started getting off. She said, where are you going? I said, I want to turn the light out. The bulb is burning my ass. <laughs> I'm, a fun one. I'm a fine one to talk about weight, aren't I? Look at the weight I've put on the last couple of years. I've, got, I've reached the age where I'm not only retaining water, I'm leaking it at the same time. <laughs> I'm trying to reduce it. You know, when a man has sex with a woman, he, he can use up to 250 calories. 3,000 if she keeps her tights on. <laughs> but I don't like dieting. We know I was like dieting. We're always looking for quick ways to lose weight. Now the ladies have got this uh, lotion from France. They rub it on the belly and it gets rid of the cellulite. It's meant to reduce the size of your belly, ladies. I thought, I'll try that. And I thought, wait a minute. What if it drips? So I didn't bother. <laughs> My wife's a size now, you should see my wife now, is she big? I took her to the opera, nobody would leave until she sang. <laughs> She's tried liposuction, do you know about that? They suck the fat out of you, they literally suck the fat out of you. Well, she has burnt out two hoovers so far. <laughs> they say you go to the, the liposuction clinic and they, just, they suck the fat out, and it's just like going to the hairdressers. They go, okay, could you take a little off that side, please? and the same amount off that side, please. And could you leave the parting in the middle where it is? <laughs> you know the worst time for putting on weight? You know this. If you're a smoker and you stop smoking, boom, bound to happen. I know my wife smokes. She says it's a hobby, like uh, stamp collecting. Do you buy that? Smoking is a hobby, like stamp collecting? How many stamp collectors do you know wake up first thing in the morning and go, where? Where are those damn stamps? <laughs> I gotta have a lick now. <laughs> this album is empty. There's gotta be a 19p commemorative somewhere in this bloody house. <laughs> I, I don't smoke, but I can help you stop smoking in bed. If you smoke in bed, I can help you stop. All you have to do is two things. Buy a water bed, fill it with petrol. It, this will work. <laughs> it will work. I 
I have a sister. She's an infomaniac slut. Her name is Beryl. She smokes a pipe. I think she does. She says there's nothing like clamping your lips around an old church warden. But I think you can give up smoking if you make yourself proud of it. Save the money that you, you don't spend on cigarettes where you can see it. I got a big glass jar. Try this. I put it on the mantelpiece and all the money that I saved by not buying cigarettes, I put in the glass jar. And I felt proud to see it build up. And then at the end of the month, I would take that money into town and buy cocaine. <laughs> what do you think? We should have more non-smoking zones, maybe. That would be good. The, the French in France, you're not allowed to smoke in public areas. Gosh, I hope this doesn't make the French people hostile and irritable. <laughs> people... Yeah! Yeah! Can I ask you something? Do you think we want a channel tunnel? No. no. Universal, no. Right across the entire room here at the lakeside, no. Well, we've got it. Who's it for? For the bloody French, isn't it? <laughs> So if Germany declares war again, they can be in London with their hands up that much quicker. <laughs> you know, people, people are suing the tobacco companies for lung infection. Do you know about this? People with emphysema are suing the tobacco companies and successfully they're making money. They're making money. I said to my wife, for God's sake, sue Cadbury's for your thighs. <laughs> the women I feel sorry for, so I feel really sorry for you girls who are trying to give it up. So you switch to low tar, low nicotine cigarettes. Oh, come on, that's pathetic. Just because some man has persuaded you it's worth sucking twice as hard to get half as much. <laughs> Do something else to relax instead of smoke. Get a, get, a, get a pet. You know if you stroke an animal, it slows down your heartbeat. You live longer, you relax. I have a pussycat called Sydney, and I stroke my pussycat, and I love my pussycat. They're expensive. Cats are expensive because, no, not just cat food. Cat food is not expensive, but veterinary fees are expensive. My vet told me my cat needed cat x-rays. Have you ever run into this? Do you know how much they are? 35 pounds. I mean, I love the cat. But I'm not paying 35 pounds for bloody cat x-rays. I'm sorry, I'm not. Put him in a hole, all took him to Heathrow, shoved him through security. There he was. <laughs> we got a dog living with us at the moment. My daughter's dog. She's a, she, she got pregnant. She's allergic to dog hair. We have to look after her dog. She thought it was funny to name the dog after me. The dog is called Bob. The dog is called Bob. My wife is yelling at the dog. Very badly trained dog. The neighbors know we haven't got a dog, so they think she's shouting at me. She's going, get your nose out of there, Bob. <laughs> you know you're not allowed on the bed, Bob. Stop drinking out of the toilet, Bob. Because <laughs> he does this dog. He drinks out of the toilet. Which makes me laugh, because I'm ticklish down there. <laughs> give me a tip, if you've got a dog, I'll give you a tip. If your dog poos in the house, if the dog does little jobs in the house, here's a tip. Get some elastic bands, mix them in his food. <laughs> give him his normal dog food, but put elastic bands in it. Then when he poos in the house, wait till it dries, chances are there'll be a little loop. You can pick it up. <laughs> Sling it next door. <laughs> I think dogs are more responsible towards women. They're female. Female dogs are treated better by male dogs than men treat women. Because you know, a man, if they made a little conquest, you know, they'll boast about it. They'll be down the pub telling the lads. You know that, ladies. But you'd never find a dog down on the corner saying, Rex, Rover, come here. <laughs> See that hot bitch over there? I had her uh, last night. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Twelve tits. Twelve tits. <laughs> I had a Rottweiler once. I, well, I say a Rottweiler. It was half Rottweiler and half sheepdog. It used to herd things together and kill them. And... <laughs> I miss Fluffy, but my, my brother, my brother has a pit bull, they're terrifying, pit bull terriers are terrifying, and when they bite people, what do they do? They take them to the vet, 
and castrate them. Excuse me, that's the wrong end. <laughs> Pull their teeth out. If you take the bollocks off, you've nowhere to kick them. My brother's pit, his pit bull terrier comes in the room, Christmas this was, I'm sitting there, innocently, he falls in love with my shin. <laughs> oh yes, get, gets the hots for my right leg, starts having it away with me. He's a pit bull terrier, for Christ's sake. What am I supposed to do? I faked an orgasm. <laughs> and dogs, they, the moment you meet a dog, where does it sniff, where does it sniff? <laughs> Not your foot, is it, or your hand, it's straight in there, isn't it? And what do people say when that happens? They go, oh, ha, 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 he's smelling my dog. <laughs> well, you keep it in a bloody funny place, don't you? Why don't you unzip your fly, let him breathe a little bit? <laughs> That's why I don't like big dogs, because big dogs, wherever you are, when big dogs come in the room, they run out of you and they stick their snouts in your crotch and they go, <laughs> And little dogs are worse, because you've got to get right down on the floor to let them do it. <laughs> I think dogs are smarter than us, you know. Dogs, ever notice this? Dogs never, ever tread in dog shit. <laughs> They've got twice as many chances as us, you know. This dog of ours goes around, we've got a farm next to us, and he goes around and tries to have it away with the chickens. And the cockerel, doesn't like that, because there's a cockerel in there who clucks defiance. That's distinct from the average solicitor. The cockerel clucks defiance, whereas the average solicitor went on. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't know what a cockerel's got to be so cocky about. I heard on a programme on TV that a cockerel, when he has sex with a hen, takes a quarter of a second. A quarter of a second. You feel better about this man? Yes. <laughs> That's all it takes. He goes cock-a-doo-doo-doo, -doo, and he already cock-a-doo-doo did, didn't he? <laughs> how long is a quarter of a second? I don't know how to measure that. Is that a quarter of a second? That's it. That's all it is, isn't it? That's a quarter of a second. What's that like for the hens? They're in the farmyard picking up corn. Oh, there's some corn over there. Or... What the hell is that? <laughs> you see that? What happened? That's why cockerels walk backwards. They're going, sorry. <laughs> You're a wonderful audience. Is there anyone here from Reading tonight? Anyone from Reading? Uh, I knew you would be, because Reading is very close to where we're doing this at the lakeside, and I read in the Reading paper, and it just caught my eye, that police arrested half a dozen prostitutes in Reading last week, and two of them turned out to be virgins, which goes to show you how short money is in Reading. <laughs> I have never been to a prostitute. Once, I went once. Okay, I went once, for an estimate. <laughs> no, no. Why should I go to bed with someone who has utter contempt for me and is only doing it for the money? I've got that at home. I... <laughs> I was sitting over there at one of those tables about two years ago, and it was late at night, the whole crowd had left, all the good customers had gone, and I was sitting there just nursing a last little drink, and a girl came in off the street. I say a girl, she was a mature woman, and I should have known that she had some form of infection by the way she walked in. Now, <laughs> and she rattled a tin that said, keep prostitutes off the streets. I said, how much shall I put in? She said, it depends on how long you want to keep me off the streets. <laughs> and it put me in mind, of that earlier this year, I was in Hollywood. Uh, we were in Los Angeles doing the ITV Movie Awards, which is fascinating. Hollywood, or as Hugh Grant calls it, Tonsil Town. <laughs> I went to the Porno Awards. Did you ever watch porno movies? Have you ever seen a porno movie? You see, with a porno movie, what annoys me is the plot's never any good. You know, at the end of a porno movie, when you finish watching it, you never say to yourself, that's a clever twist. Well, maybe you do, but not about the plot. <laughs> I saw a porno movie the other day that really raised my eyebrows. But that's old age for you. 
My wife's approved, she doesn't approve. She said, if ever I caught you watching a hardcore porno film, I'd kill myself. I thought, wait, hold on, Bob, this is too easy. <laughs> because now everybody's making them. Every little cheap jack, little firm, every little get-rich-quick firm is ripping off Disney. They're, they're remaking the Disney classics. That's wicked. Destroys your illusions. They're making, they're making films called Herpes, the Love Bug. <laughs> Debbie does Dumbo. <laughs> They've even remade Pinocchio as a blue movie. The, uh, the leading actress sits on Pinocchio's face and says, Tell a lie, tell the truth, tell a lie, tell the truth. <laughs> I'm still wondering how many of you have actually seen a hard porn movie, a hardcore porn. See, my doctor, I have a nice doctor, but when he was a young medical student, in order to pay his fees, he used to act in porno movies, and this affects his practice even today. When he's giving you an injection, at the last minute, he pulls it out and squirts it over you. <laughs> Forty-five of you have seen hardcore porno movies. I like my doctor. I went for a complete medical examination. Because you get my age, you have to be very careful. You know, you want to know how long you're going to live. So he gave me a complete medical examination. At one point, we got two complete. I was bending over like this. He said, do you mind if I insert one finger? I said, insert two. I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> so he did. I said, is there any way I can help you? He said, don't whistle. Okay, okay. <laughs> He checked, he checked my blood count, he checked my pulse rate, he checked everything, and then he said, you wouldn't believe this, he said, I want a sperm count. I said, what are you talking about, man of my age, a sperm count, you're kidding. Because you know, when I'm a young man, when you're a young man, and you, you actually erupt. I said to my wife the other day, isn't it amazing that it, it takes a young man, half a million sperm, to fertilize one egg? I wonder why that is. She said, because they're men and they won't ask for bloody directions. <laughs> He said, here's a specimen jar, I said. He said, I'd like you to uh, put a sample in that. I said, what now? He said, Poss poss if possible, yes, now. I said, I can't do it now. I said, yeah, if I were a young man, every five minutes I could have done it. But I'm an older man now, I, I really can't do that. He said, well, take the jar home and do it as soon as you can and bring it back. He said, you fill it. I said, fill it? <laughs> he said, give me a measurable specimen and come back with it. I said, all right. Now, I'm in misery now, this bloody jar. I'll take it home, I'll go in the bathroom. It's years since I locked myself in the bathroom, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's a humiliating thing for a man of my age to have to do this. Well, I, I thought, well, try it differently than you used to, so I tried it with my left hand. <laughs> I thought it might be a novelty, you know. I damn nearly sprained my wrist after 10 minutes, you know. <laughs> So I've got, a, I've got a dodgy elbow, but I switched to the right hand. Still no results, so I, I called on the wife to help. She wrapped a cloth around it and tried both hands. She said, <laughs> well, that went on for about half an hour, then... Then her mother had a go, bless her. What a woman, what a woman. She tried it with her teeth in, she tried it with her teeth <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we could not get the lid off that bloody jar. <laughs> oh no, oh no, this is entirely wrong. No, 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 Primrose, no, not now, not now, dear, not now, possibly later, but not now, not now, but maybe not ever. Now, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have come on. Did you encourage her to do that? You did, didn't you, you sod. I'm sorry, lady, I don't want to be harsh. She's a sweet girl, she's my very innocent niece, Primrose, and she I used to see me doing Opportunity Knocks, and she thought, if she came along tonight, she might be able to audition for you. And I said, maybe later, it's not a sort of night in which that could happen. I didn't expect her to come on like that. Now, she did that, didn't it? Do you ever wonder, Laurie, why people take an instant dislike to you? It saves time, Laurie. <laughs> this gang of louts you brought with you, the difference between me and Prince Philip driving a four-horse carriage, 
is that he only has to look at four assholes. <laughs> I don't mean to be harsh with you, Laurie, but God, God. Little wounded face. Laurie Holloway, ladies and gentlemen, very unlucky man. Got VD from a wet dream. You can't get much unlucky. <laughs> Sorry about that with Primrose. And Laurie, Laurie tries to keep up with all the new musical trends, don't you? You do, don't you? He went to see the Rolling Stones and slowly realised he was stoned. <laughs> he went to a, an open-air concert of Wet, Wet, Wet and slowly realised he was wet. He went to see Big Country and slowly realised... <laughs> ...that he was a complete idiot. Are you all right this evening? You're yeah, a funny lad you are. You smile, you nod, you're so brave. He's not well. He's got no toes on his left foot. Do you mind if I tell him? When it's hot like this, hot night like this, he takes all his clothes off, every stitch, and he sits there going, I can count to 21. I hate that joke. <laughs> <laughs> and he's drinking, he's getting it down him, and he's got, got, on a hot night like this, he's got the electric fan there with the metal blades. <laughs> and he thinks to himself, I'll cut my toenails on the cheap. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, and he sticks his footy into the electric fan, Suddenly the air is filled with a blur of flying piggies. <laughs> Little toes going... Bit, 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 bop, bop. He's sitting there, stoned out of his mind, chug lugging like the meths, singing toot toot tootsie goodbye. <laughs> Don't feel sorry for him, he pulls the birds when he tells them he's got a foot and a half, they say, really? <laughs> <laughs> the male anatomy is a miracle, you know. You ask me, is size important? When are we men going to realise? It's not the size of the ship that counts, it's the ability to stay important to all the passengers have disembarked. <laughs> you ask women, they'll say size isn't important, it's what's in a man's mind that's important. Oh yes, as in the expression, he's hung like Albert Einstein. <laughs> women will say, it's not the size of it, it's what you do with it. What the hell do you expect? just to do with it. It's not a sophisticated food processor with 16 attachments and 22 blending modes and two gears. It has only two gears, forward and back, that's all it does. <laughs> you can fool around with the speed, fast or slow, but that varies according to fuel consumption. <laughs> men had babies, you know ladies, we couldn't take it. You know men would be so frightened, have babies, <laughs> the pain, the difficulties, and we'd take advantage of you. We'd lie around for the whole nine months like a walrus, on the couch. <laughs> Bring me another lager, I'm drinking for two, love. <laughs> you want to feel the baby kick? Come on, feel the baby kick. Feel down a bit lower, his leg's sticking out, give it a tug. <laughs> another prenatal clinic, can you imagine men, when they started to develop breasts to feed the baby, you start to get bigger and bigger and we go, oh, oh, oh. you know, you ladies, when you start to feed a baby, you look like Madonna and child, that's a beautiful picture. We would be squirting one another. Foo, foo, foo. <laughs> Hold still, I'll put your fag out. Write <laughs> that name in the snow. <laughs> Once, twice, three times a lady. Can you imagine men with tits? Those are very nice tits, Harry. Very nice indeed. Can I cop a grope? Thank you very much. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> See, breasts are very important, because if it weren't for breasts, employers wouldn't know who to give the smaller paycheck to. <laughs> ah -ha -ha. Breasts are uh, an amazing thing, because men, some men think the bigger a woman's breasts are, the less intelligent she is. It's the opposite with me. I find the bigger a woman's breasts are, the less intelligent I become. <laughs> It'd be wonderful, most of women I think would agree with me, it would be wonderful if breasts were detachable. You could say to your partner, look, here you, are, you play with those, I'm going to the hairdressers for a couple of hours. <laughs> if God had designed women properly, you would have detachable breasts. You'd have different sets, different sizes of breasts. You know, you go, well, I'm going to go jogging, I'll put on the weenies. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to see the bank manager about extending my overdraft. <laughs> I asked my nymphomaniac slut of a sister, Beryl. I said, would you like to have a willy? She said, no, I wouldn't want to have a willy. I'd rather collect them, she said. I'd rather collect them. But she wouldn't want to have one. 
So it's collecting them as a hobby, like fishing. The little ones you throw back. The big ones you mount. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry about this. It's Primrose again. I'm sorry, no darling, not now. Not now, sweetheart, I'm sorry, if at all, later, later. Not now, darling, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I oh, know. Breaks my heart to be hard with her. She's never been touched. She's virginal. She's like the Mary Celeste. Alone, silent, and has no semen in her whatsoever. <laughs> the most innocent member of my family, unlike my son, by the way, found out the other day my youngest son is gay. He told us over Christmas dinner. He chose to do it over Christmas dinner. When he said, please, would you pass the Brussels sprouts? to a homosexual, and she passed them to me, there was a hell of a row. <laughs> I said, are you sure you're gay, son? I said, are you seeing a psychiatrist? He said, no, a corporal in the guards. <laughs> He's having trouble with his landlord because he hasn't got the money. I said, haven't you paid your rent, boy? He said, yes, that's why I haven't got the money. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I'd been gay. Bit of a flop at being heterosexual, I'll tell you. Just, I've got so lousy lately. I'm a lousy lover, that's the truth. Lately I'm so rotten in bed, I fantasize that I'm somebody else. <laughs> My wife says she'd make love like a video recorder. I said, what do you mean? She said, fast forward, pause and eject. <laughs> I tried to woo her. I do try. I bought her favorite ice cream and I rushed it home. I said, come on, here's your ice cream. I said, it's as hard as you know what. She said, oh, is it? Pour me some. <laughs> I'm getting fed up with her. I hate to please her these days. I've got to the point where I hate to please her. I buy condoms that are ribbed for extra pleasure, but I turn them inside out. <laughs> I hate buying condoms. Don't you hate it? Oh, my God. And I hate it when you see that sign. These condoms have been pre-tested. By whom, I'd like to know. <laughs> I want names and pictures. And they come in different sizes now. Did you know that? But if you haven't known that, over the last four weeks, you've been able to buy condoms in different sizes. <laughs> How embarrassing is that going to be when a man walks into a, a chemist shop and says, um, can, I, can, I, can I buy a packet, please? Packet, packet of three, please. What size? Um, um. Petite. <laughs> How, How are they going to deal with men who don't know their size? So as we go in there, we don't know what size we are. We're going to have a shoe measuring device hanging up. <laughs> we have a board with different size holes in it. <laughs> you know men are going to lie. They're not going to tell the truth, are they? You know men. Come on, women, you know. They're going to go in there and go, pack of three, please, darling. Size? What size have you got, dear? Small? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Medium? Not what I'd call it, love. Large? What else have you got? Oh, yeah, I'll take the Majestic. Yeah. <laughs> and what's he going to do with that when he gets it home? Three sizes too big. What's he going to use? Inner soles? <laughs> do you know who buys condoms in this country? 54% of the condoms sold in this country are bought by women. By women. You women buy them. Oh, yes. How many women here in the lakeside tonight have bought condoms within the last seven days? <laughs> Suddenly it's Catholic night at the lakeside. <laughs> I'll do the rest of the act in Latin. <laughs> Women buy fancy condoms. This is what it says, statistically. Men buy plain condoms, absolutely plain ones. Just the practical. But women buy the fancy ones. Different colours, different shapes, little knobs and ribs, little bumps, little ticklers and feathers on them. <laughs> you can make shadow puppets for these things. <laughs> Look, a bunny rabbit. Pop, pop, pop. <laughs> Different colours. What's the colours about? What thinks the colours about? That's fantasy, right, ladies? Am I guessing right? You put a green one on your partner. Have him stand on the bed going, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> oh, my jolly green jar! <laughs> Don't squeeze the sprouts. <laughs> They're different flavors.
flavors now. When did you develop taste buds down there? You can buy them every kind of flavor. I bought a whole box, wild strawberry. I tasted one well. That box was empty before I knew it. They're so Moorish. They're like bubble gum, except you can blow much bigger bubbles. And now they've got them, so they glow. Do you know about these? They glow in the dark. Oh, my slut of a sister, her face lights up when she sees one of these. <laughs> they shine brightly in the darkness. What's the point of that? I mean, what is that for? I can see it as a bit of a giggle during foreplay. But you don't want a luminous dong when you get down to serious sex. You're going in and out, you'd strobe. What's someone going to think if they're watching your window from outside in the dark? <laughs> What's going on in there? I don't know, I think somebody's opening and closing the fridge very fast. <laughs> These days, didn't happen when I was young, sex toys, marvel. I took my wife to an adult toy shop, an adult toy shop. They sell these things, they sell stuff I've never heard of. Do you know about edible panties? Edible underwear. Do you know about this? Edible panties. My wife said, why don't we try those? I don't eat her cooking. I'm not going to eat her knickers. <laughs> Mr. Swell Guy, the cream. Mr. Swell Guy. You heard of this? Man's supposed to take this Mr. Swell Guy like that and rub it on his reproductive equipment and it'll make it much, much bigger. Well, wouldn't it make his hands bigger too? <laughs> Shouldn't be too difficult to figure out who's using this stuff, should it? <laughs> Walking around dragging his knuckles by. <laughs> and inflatable women, isn't this pathetic, ladies? Men have reached the point where they're sleeping with balloons, I ask you. Helga, your inflatable girlfriend, she never gets a headache. Know what you do after you've blown the bloody thing up? <laughs> 20 minutes to blow, I'm told, to blow. <laughs> and you know, men, when they want sex, they want it now, now. Women are different. Women, when they feel stimulated, they feel desire, they want to be built up slowly from plateau to plateau. They want to be just teased up the mountain until they reach the pinnacle of enjoyment. But a man who wants it now, he doesn't want to spend 20 minutes going... Oh, bugger, I don't need the arm. I made the mistake of buying a book which turned my wife on. Just when I thought she'd gone, become quiescent, I give her this book called Sensual Food. Do you know about this? You cover your partner's body with whipped cream and then slowly lick it off. She said, we've got to try this, she said. You cover my body with whipped cream, she said, and slowly lick it off. I don't like whipped cream. turns me up, whipped cream. <laughs> so could we do it with something else? Well, we went through several suggestions. She turned down the fish paste straight away. <laughs> she wouldn't have the Branston pickle <laughs> or the Campbell condensed soup, mainly on account of little bits getting lodged. <laughs> And after we've gone through everything that Sainsbury's or Tesco's had to offer, she eventually settled, very grudgingly I may say, for Marmite. <laughs> twelve and a half jars, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I went through twelve and a half jars. When I finish, you lay there like a giant twiglet. <laughs> she said, start. So I started on her left arm. It's ever so rich, you know, that stuff. 
got the arm completely clear. <laughs> I felt full and I nodded off. <laughs> she spent the night in the shower apparently scrubbing. <laughs> I thought, thank God that's over. Then what happens? She catches me eating a bar of chocolate. She says, oh, he likes chocolate, does he? <laughs> then we'll do it with chocolate. Not normal chocolate, not normal nice brown chocolate. Oh, no. That sickly white stuff. <laughs> every four weeks or so, every four weeks or so, I've got to lick it off her. I tell you, my friends, if I hear that cry once more, the milky bars are on me. <laughs> You've been a wonderful audience tonight. Maybe I should learn from you. Is there any woman here tonight who's here with a great lover? Any woman who's sitting here with a great lover? One lady is waving. What makes you a great lover, sir? What makes you such a great lover? He doesn't answer, he just sits there licking his eyebrows, will never know his secret. <laughs> any men here tonight who are impotent? Ah, oh, you can't get your arms up either, eh? <laughs> What's that? Is that a phone? Could somebody answer that, please? Bob, it's for you. Oh, God. Love us. You've got a bloody mobile. I can't take a call now, Laurie. I'm in the it's middle of making a video. It's a, it's a booking. It's a booking. Oh, it's a bo booking. <laughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. It's a booking. Hello. Yes. I'm in the middle of an actor. I'm in the middle of doing a video. I mean, yes, certainly, excuse me just a second. When? Next Sunday? No, I'm not free next Sunday. Uh, oh, that's, that's quite good money. Where is this? Eastbourne, who, who's it for? The Mother's Church Union, Sunday afternoon. I don't really do that kind of thing. Um, what sort of an act do, do you want? Something innocent? I think I have just the person for you. I, I have an innocent niece called Primrose, and she's, she's a very talented child, and I think that if she sang, listen, if she sang for the audience here tonight, they're a very critical, very intelligent audience. If they like what she did, if they like what my, what my niece did, would you book her? So it depends on your reaction, ladies and gentlemen. The, the audience is agreeing to this. Bring, bring Primrose out, have us, I can't, you're breaking up, I can't hear you. I'll go out in the car park, I'll talk to you in the car park, we'll talk money. No, no, I can't agree with that. No, the child is singing now, the child is singing for the audience, and I will discuss it with you. I will, yes, but I can't hear you, I'm taking you out in the car park. I'm taking you call in the car park. Yes, we'll discuss money out here. Oh, listen to the audience. Listen to the audience. And she just finished.
You heard, you heard the applause? Well, you can hear the audience applauding. No, I mean, the audience just, you heard them. The audience applauded. They loved her singing. A simple little song. And the crowd loved it. Did you enjoy her? There you are. There you are. That's, so, okay, that's a definite booking. That's Eastbourne, next Sunday, 3 o'clock. The, the Mother's Church Union. She'll be there. She'll be a, a sensation for you, I'm sure. Oh, so I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Is there anything you wanted to ask me before, before we hang up? What does she do? Well, she comes out and she sings Home Sweet Home. And then she shows them her tits and her ass. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for my innocent niece, Primrose. scrapbook out yesterday Bob's scrapbook going back over the years lived a long time <laughs> when I was 17 it was a very good year it was a very good year for small town girls and soft summer nights we'd hide from the lights on the village green when I was 17 lies Never had any girls when I was 17. It's a pimply little fat fart I was. <laughs> Stuck in my bedroom all alone. I thought I'd locked the door. My mother burst into my bedroom. I was doing something, ladies and gentlemen, that every adolescent boy does, but I shouldn't have been doing it. And my mother said, Robert, you'll go blind if you do that. Because you see, I was trying to poke my eyes out with a stick. <laughs> My father stopped me masturbating by putting something in my tea. It was my penis. <laughs> when I was 21, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for city girls who lived up the stair with perfumed hair that came undone when I was 21. I was so desperate to meet a girl when I was 21. I had no opening conversational gambit. I didn't know how to chat up a girl up. So what I did was, it was a weird scheme, but kind of inventive, I got some strong industrial magnets, half a dozen of them, and I sewed them in a ring around my fly. And then I posed on a stool in the bar of the local dance hall, like this, and waited for a girl to come by with a lot of metal rings on her right hand. I figured her hand would fly into my fly. And this would be a delicate way of starting a conversation. I must have been looking the other way when the short man with braces on his teeth came by. <laughs> when I was 35, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for blue-blooded girls of independent means. We'd ride in limousines, their chauffeurs would drive. When I was 35, I remember I once went to an orgy. I remember the one I went to so clearly. It was kind of embarrassing, because afterwards you didn't know who to thank. <laughs> there were about 17 of us there. We all took our clothes off. We were sort of inhibited. Somebody opened a bottle of whiskey. I got my first unintentional laugh of the evening when I said, mine's a large one. We had a wonderful time. I've never forgotten it. It was sensational. But the following morning, the worst thing in the world had happened to me. I went into the bathroom as a man does. I looked down as a man does. And I saw a blister in a place where a man never wants to see a blister. I was panicking. I rushed to the doctor. I showed it to him. I said, what do you think? Is there someone out there with an unspeakable disease? He said, no, there's someone out there with only one contact lens. <laughs> But now the days are short I'm in the autumn of the year And I think of my life As vintage wine from fine old kegs From the brim to the dregs It poured fine and clear hmm. People say to me 
After you've been married to the same partner for so many years, isn't sex sort of predictable? You know exactly what it's got to be like. And I say no. It's a bit like seeing your favorite movie. You can see that over and over again, and although you know what's going to happen, and you know how it's going to end, it's never boring. My favorite movie is Frankenstein. <laughs> and in a way, my wife's exactly like Baron Frankenstein, because she takes seemingly dead tissue and raises it into life. Comes a monster, a huge monster. <laughs> and then the plot continues as you know it will. The creator and the monster struggle. There's a climax. And then the very person who has created this giant beast returns it to the inanimate state in which he found it. And in a way, every year it gets better and better because my wife looks more and more like Peter Cushing. <laughs> and though it hasn't all been heaven For an old fart of 67 It's been a very good year I can't walk away from a beautiful woman or a warm audience. It's such a joy to be with you tonight. Thank you for being here for this video. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your laughter, your applause, your sense of humor. It's Eskimo. <laughs> and my father once rubbed noses with an Eskimo girl and got a serious case of sniffleus. Sniffleus. <laughs> this Eskimo has trouble with his snowmobile. He takes it to a mechanic. The mechanic says, it looks as if you've just blown a seal. And the Eskimo says, no, it's the frost on my moustache gives you that impression. <laughs> Saud says to Lawrence of Arabia, would you do me a favor? Would you take 12 virgins across the Sahara Desert to a holy retreat on Mount Ararat? He says, yes, of course I will. He said, but they can't ride camels, otherwise they might injure their perfect virginity. They have to go on foot. And they must never look upon a man's nakedness, else they cannot become brides of Allah. And Lawrence of Arabia says, trust me, squire. <laughs> he takes them off across the featureless desert, and he's been two days out when he realizes he's made a horrible mistake. He's bursting for a pee. There's nowhere to pee. It's all right for the virgins. They can squat down. They've got all these robes. But he can't even risk the prick of a cactus. Because there isn't one. Three days out, he is in agony. Cannot pee anywhere. Sees a Bedouin coming the other way. Beckons him over. He says, do you want to earn half a shekel? The Bedouin says, yes, Effendi. He said, well, come a little closer. I don't want those girls to hear. He said, I want you to keep them amused for a few moments. Could you do that? He said, I don't know, Effendi. He said, yes, you could. What I want you to do is say, when they handed out brains, I thought they said trains, and I missed mine. When they handed out noses, I thought they said roses, and I asked for a big red one. When they handed out ears, I thought they said beers, I asked for two jugs. When they handed out chins, I thought they said gins, I asked for a double. And when they handed out legs, I thought they said kegs, I asked for two big ones. Can you remember that? He said, no, no. He said, well, repeat it back to me. He said, I'll try. When they handed out brains, I thought they said trains, and I missed one. I handed out noses, I thought they said bro. I thought they said bro. You're pissing down my leg, aren't you? <laughs> My brother, my brother-in-law, the leech, he's in jail. He was imprisoned for his beliefs. He believed you could wank on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and a man in jail with another man always wants to know what he's in for. He says, what are you in for? The other fellow said, uh, well, you know, 
animal husbandry, you could call it. He said, what are you talking about, animal husbandry? What do you mean? What crime have you committed? He said, well, you know, like swan-upping, you know. <laughs> he said, you're not telling me that you can sort with God's dumb creatures, are you? God, how low can you get? He said, hamsters. <laughs> Edward, last night in the Marines, his very last night serving in the Marines, Prince Edward was given a wonderful dinner, a marvellous ball, and around about midnight he left slightly the worse for booze. And he's crossing the parade square in his full dress uniform on a moonless night. When it came over him that he'd had too much to drink, the cold air hit him, all down the front. All down the front of his beautiful dress uniform, he erpsed. Got into his quarters, crashed out. Woke up to the shh, 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 the soft sound of brushing. There was his Batman, brushing the dried herbs of his uniform tunic. And he goes, a man has to be a hero to his Batman. He said, oh, my Lord, I remember that. Coming back from the function last night, I bumped into a corporal who threw up all over me. We must find out who he is and give him three months confined to barracks. The Batman said, oh, I shall make it six months, Your Royal Highness. Why? He's shit in your trousers as well. <laughs> And if you were wondering how far I'd go tonight, that's about as far as I can go. That prostitute called Divine is back in the headlines. She wants to become a student, but I don't know. The authorities say she can't, she's already blown one grant. And that's about as far as I can go. Your buddy has bought a barge to take on the water. Upon some far canal, he goes with a flow. You think that you see your pal, and you go, far canal. And your job as a shipping clerk is terribly busy. You're shipping out goods non-stop, it's really all go. What's this, you're on the parcel shelf? My God, you've shipped yourself. <laughs> That's as far, as far as I can go. Say I'm dry, say I'm fighting shy. Well, my image is bearing the brunt. I may plan to be Superman, but really I'm just a Clark Kent. <laughs> If you should ask for more, I'll spell it out for you. Those two words, for and more, have an R and an O. And though there's an F in four, there ain't no F in more. <laughs> <laughs>